Welcome to Lessons for the Journey. Lessons for the Journey is the teaching ministry of Dr. David Clifton. These lessons from Scripture are designed to aid in the journey of faith and the journey of life. Let's open our Bibles and join today's lesson. notice under scripture this morning it says various because you're going to be hard pressed to follow where I'm going this morning let me tell you what I do um, usually around Easter and Christmas time uh, I go to a book I guess best said compiled by Dr. John MacArthur it's a book he entitled One Perfect Life and what he has done is he's taken all four gospels and put them together in chronological order as the events occurred. And you get all four of the gospel writers, their take on it are all combined together. <clears throat> so if you want to try to follow me, I'm going to be reading from Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, John 12, just to be a few places. Uh, one place you could go, because I'm going to get there shortly, if you want to stick your finger in Isaiah, I'll be there shortly reading from that. But I want to read these to you, uh, the events that happened on this day we call Palm Sunday. I think Matthew is the one that begins this, but at any rate. The next day Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, on which no one has sat. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there, the owners, said to him, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him, just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. They brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus, laid their clothes on them, and they set Jesus on the colt. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Fear not, tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. And a very great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road <clears throat> and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason the people also met him because they heard, had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Then as he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples who went before and those who followed began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that he comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the ground, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, 
For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. Then the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? So when he had looked around at all these things, he left them and went out to the city to Be- of the city to Bethany, as the hour was already late, and he lodged there with the twelve. <clears throat> I know that was a fairly long story, but it covers the events. Have you ever stopped to consider that when the Lord sent those two disciples into the, into the city, he told them exactly what they were going to find? He hadn't been into the city yet. Because he's God. He knew these kind of things. He sent them in. He told them the exact circumstances of their errand. And he already knew the particular animal that they would find. He said, go into a particular village and you'll find. Wouldn't it be nice if we got detailed instructions like that now? Go to the grocery store today and you will meet. And you'd know just the person you were supposed to talk to the person that God had appointed for you to be able to speak with that day. And I wonder if God's almost that deliberate still, if we're paying attention. How many of you guys are like me? You get so wrapped up in what you're supposed to be doing, you don't have time for the detours that God puts into your life. I have to constantly remind myself of that. But God, even now, he knows our circumstances, right? He knows when we go out, who is going to be in our way that's going to create aggravation for us? Or is that just me? That's just, oh, that's just me. Thank you. So they go and they find things exactly as he said. And they say exactly the words he told them to say. And exactly what is supposed to happen happens because they followed instructions. Following God's will is an amazing thing, even in this day. He said, you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her on which no one has sat. Now, why is that significant? Is that significant? A lot of things in scripture that we overlook are significant. You see, throughout the Old Testament, there's evidence that the Jews regarded animals who had never done any work to be very significant and and readily suited for holy purposes. You can find that in Numbers, Deuteronomy, and uh, 1 Samuel references to that. And has it escaped your notice that this is an unbroken animal on which no one has ever sat? Now, the only thing I've ever ridden, somebody had taken the time to break before I ever got on it, and I'm very thankful for that. But I've seen animals trying to be broken. And yet this animal that had never been broken, on which no one had ever sat, had absolutely no complaint when it carried its creator. See the things, even in the details, God is there ahead of time already. But why was all this necessary? Well, Matthew is the one that says all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He should have said by the prophets. Because in Matthew 21, 5, he says, Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. The passage we read before. And in that passage, Matthew is actually quoting from Isaiah and from Zechariah. Zechariah, I'm sorry, Isaiah 62, 11. I told you to put your finger in in Isaiah. This is important enough. I want you to turn there. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11. And he also brings in part of Zechariah 9, 9. But Isaiah is 
perhaps the more important of the two. Isaiah 62, 11 says, Behold, Yahweh has announced to the ends of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Now, the Hebrew word that is there that is translated into English as salvation is yesha. And no, I'm not trying to make you Hebrew scholars. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I know enough to be very dangerous. But it is identical to the name of Messiah except for one letter. Messiah's name is Yeshua. The Hebrew word here is yesha. Yeshua means the Lord is salvation. This is the word that is translating Yesha. But Isaiah describes Yesha, that is salvation, as a person, right? Look at the pronouns. They're masculine pronouns. And in most Bibles, not only are they masculine pronouns, they are capitalized masculine pronouns. Why do we capitalize pronouns if they're not at the beginning of a sentence? Because they're referring to deity. We're talking about God because who else besides God is salvation? So it could very well be that 700 years before Messiah ever came, Isaiah is writing about him pretty much by name. The other verse quoted is Zechariah 9.9. It mentions the king coming on the fold of a pack animal. And Jesus is surrounded by this crowd, and they would have been well-versed in these verses. At least many of them would have been. They had gone to synagogue. They had studied the scriptures. They would have known. But Jesus deliberately chose a young animal, and he purposefully did not arrive on foot. Why is that? Well, for one thing, prophecy. Matthew already told us these things were done to fulfill the prophecy that was written. But also because at the time, in that culture, when one rode in on a colt, rather than coming in on a majestic war horse or something like that, it was symbolic of being a person of peace. That's why Jesus chose the colt. Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem as a conquering general that time. That comes later. But rather he came as a triumphant, although suffering, servant. The rabbis in Jesus' day had several different theories regarding how Messiah would come. Based on Daniel 7.13, they thought that Messiah would come as a majestic conqueror. But based on Zechariah 9.9, others thought that he would come humble and lowly and riding on a colt. See, what they did not put together was that it's one Messiah two times. Because when he came this time, he was lowly and riding on a colt. That's not how he'll come back, though. So in the first century as well, some of the rabbis reconciled this by saying, well, if Israel is in the right spiritual condition, then we will receive the conquering Messiah. But if we're not where we need to be, then we will receive the suffering Messiah. But them being who they thought they were, much like we sometimes think we are, of course they were ready, so it's going to be the conquering Messiah, right? That's who they were expecting. That's the only one they were looking for. They still hadn't gotten that part I just told you about. One Messiah, two times. So scripture continues, his disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. Doesn't that put us in good company? There's several times in scripture where Jesus kind of turns around and says, don't you guys get it yet? Which puts us in really good company because when we're going through and we're having difficulty understanding a scriptural truth, we're in the same company as the disciples. So rejoice in that and keep striving and you'll figure it out. Because these folks who Jesus turned around to and said, don't you get it yet? In just a little while, they're going to be turning the world upside down with the message of the gospel. That's the power that the Holy Spirit provides for us. They didn't understand everything overnight, and some of it had to be repeated. 
sometimes even several times, but they got it and God used them. So this procession begins. What happened here? Did the disciples go out and drum up a parade and get everything organized? No. It was a natural outflow of what had happened. And a very great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard Jesus was coming took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and they spread their clothes on the road. You know the story. How many ways can you tell the story of Palm Sunday and how many times have you heard it? We know what happened. But if you think about it, the word would have spread from the villages. It wasn't that long before that Jesus had told Lazarus to come out of the grave, and he did. But nobody would have talked about that, right? You know they would have. It would have gone everywhere. You know, that would have been, as they say, gossip is currency in some places. That would have been a story that the folks that were there would have told for anybody that would stand still long enough to listen to it. And think about it. <clears throat> Bethany's not that far from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was packed during Passover time. It was one of the feasts when people came into Jerusalem. And a lot of times they would stay with relatives. So when you have relatives come in from out of town, don't you catch them up on the news of what's been going on? How many times in how many houses do you think the story of Lazarus coming out of the tomb was repeated over that Passover time? So they had heard, and they had heard that he wasn't that far away, and they're thinking... Well, maybe he'll come into town. Maybe we'll get to see him. And then they heard, hey, he's coming. Word would have gotten out that he was making his way. So the crowd went out to meet him. And they were spreading palm fronds and clothes in the way. They were it's like receiving royalty. And indeed they were receiving royalty. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Wouldn't you go meet somebody that raised someone from the dead? They did. They're headed out to see him. And it's like they were seeing, saying, let's go see what this guy's about. You know, we've heard about him. Let's, let's go see him now. Therefore, the Pharisees said among the, themselves, you see, you're accomplishing nothing. The whole world has gone after him. Remember the Pharisees were trying to plot against him. If you remember last time we talked about when the crowd was there when Lazarus came out of the tomb, some rejoiced and believed in, in him. Some left to go report to the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were hearing all these things that were going on and they're saying to amongst themselves, we're losing this battle. Everybody's going out to see him. And the crowds kind of proved that. On his way from Bethany, just as he reached the crest of the Mount of Olives, because it said he was beginning the descent of the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know what your image is of the Mount of Olives, but for us folks, particularly me coming from out in the Rono Valley, uh, it's just a, a bit of a hill. It's not really a mountain like we would think of. Um, it's Perhaps, and I'm being generous, half the size of Afton Mountain. Most of us know where that is. Um, but he was coming from Bethany on the backside of the mountain when he got to the top, when he got to the crest, as he began to descend, coming down through the Kidron Valley and then back up to go into the Eastern Gate in Jerusalem. It's the spontaneous praise that breaks out from his followers and then from the others who were behind it's because so many of them finally recognized this is the guy. This is the one who did it. And he's done all these things and they talk among themselves about all the ministry that he has had all of this time. And so their natural reaction is to praise. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Throughout scripture, anytime anybody recognizes that God is before them, most of the time they wind flat on their face. But all of the time they wind up in worship. It's just the human reaction to being in the presence of the divine. They're recognizing this. Hosanna to the son of David. That's 
a messianic phrase. They're recognizing this is Messiah. In our 21st century American selves, we can't quite get a complete grasp on that because it's not part of our culture. It hasn't been ingrained into us. But basically they were saying, this is God's anointed one who was coming, the one we have waited for all this time. The salvation of Israel here is here. And they said, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Have you ever considered how close that is to something we can find in Luke chapter 2? You remember Luke chapter 2, right? Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. It's not that much different. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then they're saying, blessed is he. We just read those words in the Hallel. Psalm 118. The crowd recognized there was some significance in what was happening. This isn't just some guy coming in. This, there's something significant in him. There's no doubt that his miracles, his teaching, and all of the things that occurred before help them realize, yes, this is Messiah we've been waiting for for years and years. And some of the religious people, you've been around religious people. I don't ever want to be a religious person. I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want to be a religious person. The Pharisees called out to him, teacher, rebuke these folks. Don't, can't you hear what they're saying? It's blasphemy. Stop them. What did Jesus say? If I stop them, the rocks are going to cry out. The praise of God is going to happen. Whether it makes the religious leaders happy or not, it's going to happen. And then he prophesies how Jerusalem will be surrounded, which happens in 70 AD when the Romans come in. But I want to leave you with, in that particular section, they, that one stone will not be left upon another, which is what happened in the temple. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize. All these people are recognizing. But the leaders did not recognize what was going on. The time of your visitation. That Messiah was there. They didn't recognize it. And when he moved into the city, he's coming into Jerusalem. It says all the city was moved saying, who is this? And the multitudes were saying, well, don't you know? Where have you been? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the, the prophet. And he went into the temple, as he had done so many times before. And what does he do in the temple? Same thing he's been doing all throughout the gospel. He's healing the lame and he's healing the blind. He's doing the same ministry that he's always done. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, I think that was part of it, but I think the bigger part of it was here. And the children in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. So now when Jesus came down the Mount of Olives and across the Kidron Valley, he would have been coming into the eastern part of Jerusalem through the eastern gate, which is very close to the Temple Mount. And so at least the eastern part of the city knew something was going on because there's this huge commotion coming down the side of the Mount of Olives. So the people inside the city are hearing about it and word would spread as it would before cell phones and everything else. I bet the word didn't get to the west side of Jerusalem much slower than it would these days by word of mouth, people telling who went where. So people all over the city are knowing what's going on. They're wondering. All the city is moved. And I think that started once he topped the Mount of Olives and started down. He went into Jerusalem and did his ministry as he always did. And you know, if you think about it, if you ever truly feel Jesus present, it may not be, and most of the time it won't be, a physical healing, although sometimes it can be, but it can very easily be an emotional and a spiritual healing, a change in us that makes us better if we allow ourselves to recognize Jesus and spend time with him. 
In John 14, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. I read something, I don't know, on one of the things I look at. It said that when we worry, we're demonstrating the fact that we don't think God will get it right. Think on that one for a minute. When we worry, we think God won't get it right. But the religious leaders were indignant, not so much because he was doing miracles, although that bent them out of shape some, the messianic titles he was receiving. They were indignant over that. They were really adamant. Do you hear what these are saying? They asked him. Why were they so upset over this? Because he was threatening their position. If he really was Messiah, they wouldn't be in charge anymore. He was threatening their position. Do you hear what these are saying? Why were they saying it? Because the ones who were saying it had recognized that Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of God, the Anointed One, was in their presence. When God shows up, you can't avoid it. You can't miss it. And with expressions like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and being called the Messianic title, Son of David, the crowd is acknowledging left, right, and center that Messiah is here among us. And what most of them did not know, maybe a few, and what I suspect most of us don't recall Maybe we've heard it before and it's stuck somewhere in the back of our minds, but we don't recall it that much. This day is much more special than just what I've told you about so far. Remember what Matthew said, these things were done, or what the prophet has written? The date of the Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem, rode down the Mount of Olives, and into Jerusalem on a colt, a donkey, and rode up to the temple and got out and performed his mission. Got, got out. Does that show I'm 21st century? Got off this animal and walked into the temple. Would have been Sunday the 9th of Nisan, 30 AD. And you're going, well, that's good, Pastor, so what? Mildly interesting, but largely a useless fact as far as I'm concerned. That's because we don't remember things. So, take your Bibles and turn with me, because this is really important, to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. And so let me either remind you or teach you, as the case may be, what this is about. I love hearing pages turn. Thank you for bringing your Bible. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. I'm going to read just verses 24 through 26. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Holy of Holies. So you are to know and to have insight that from the going out of a word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be restored and rebuilt with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war, desolations are decreed. I'm not going to go into all of this, because you that would be a series of messages, and that's not the purpose of this time of year. Daniel speaks of weeks. The weeks he is speaking of are weeks of years. 
So every week he's talking about is seven years. With me so far? Okay. Verse 25. So you are to know and to have insight that from the going out of the word to restore the prince. What word? But now he said 70 weeks of seven years. I got ahead of myself. That would be 490 years, right? 70 times 7. 490. Thank you. So the going out of a word, it seems like that's somewhat significant if we just only knew what kind of word. Fortunately, we know it's a word concerning the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's what it even talks about. A word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, it just so happens that Nehemiah in chapter 2 recorded just such a thing for us. Artaxerxes made a decree for the Jews to go back and to build, rebuild Jerusalem. He made that decree in 445 B.C. Okay. So now let's consider. There are seven weeks and then there's 49 weeks. And then there's 62 weeks or the years and weeks and 60. If I haven't confused yet. It's 434 years if you do the math. Okay. 434 years. And if you put that together with the 62 weeks, I'm sorry, the 49 weeks, it's 483 weeks. I can't even read my notes. How can I expect you to understand what I'm talking about? 483 weeks is what it was talking about to begin with. Remember, we were talking originally about a total of 490 weeks, right? So what he is saying is that from the time Artaxerxes says, go build, rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah comes will be 483 years. Yeshua presented himself in the temple as Messiah exactly 483 years after Artaxerxes' decree. Exactly what Daniel the prophet said would happen. That's why Jesus needed to come into Jerusalem on the day he came into Jerusalem and why he needed to go to the temple to present himself as he did to fulfill the prophecy. Exactly the day that Daniel said it would occur. Amen. Wow. Exactly the day. And then he's going to be cut off because Messiah was only there a short time. And then he was cut off, right? We'll talk about that a little more. But now notice that was 483 years of 490 years total. So that means there's seven years hanging out there somewhere. Anybody know of anything that lasts for seven years that we've been told that maybe we need to look for? Yeah. I'll get to that in another sermon. That's a long time. So where are we in the story with Jesus? So when he had looked around all these things, he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, as the hour was already late. And he lodged there with the twelve. I think he went back to Mary and Martha's house, personally, and Lazarus, because he would have been back alive by now. I think they stayed with them. I don't know that for sure. But he accomplished everything he needed to do. He presented himself as Messiah in Jerusalem, in the temple. Exactly as he needed to do. He fulfilled the prophecy. And there was more, no more of this. Remember when Mary came to him at the wedding in Cana of Galilee? He said, my time has not yet come. No more of this, my time has not yet come anymore. No more of that. I think he publicly came in and made the statement, I am here. But he also stirred up the leaders who wanted to do away with him. He was threatening their positions of power. And it's scary to think what they were able to accomplish in just five days. Because this is Sunday. And people are rejoicing. Glad to see him. Now not everybody who was rejoicing. Some of them were just in the crowd. Just caught up in what was going on. But a good portion of them would have been true believers that were there. And that's the rejoicing they were doing. 
But in just five days, the situation changes drastically, doesn't it? If you come back on Friday night, we'll talk about that. But for now, let's remember that this is a day of prayer and praise. So let us let me close this, this message in prayer, and then we'll turn to number 63 and do some more praise. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and Lord, that you are true to yourself so that when you give a date, you keep the date. You're never late. And Lord, you've shown us, just it just shows the importance of when Messiah came, what he was doing, and how it was all your plan from the beginning. We pray that you'll help us to understand, help us to take this time and to praise our Lord. And Lord, to remember the other things that go with us in this holy week. Watch over us this week. Guide us. May we be looking for that place, those instructions that you're going to give us to guide us to exactly the right place so we can say the things that you want us to say to be your servants in Christ's name. Amen. Lessons for the Journey is recorded during the services of Bethlehem Congregational Church in Disputana, Virginia, where Dr. Clifton serves as pastor. If you find these lessons helpful, please click the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Join us next time for more Lessons for the Journey.